Welcome to Conceived in Liberty, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, President of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us for another special edition of the series featuring the 2021 Bradley Prize winners. And I'm so pleased to welcome Roger Ream, President of the Fund for American Studies, an educational organization whose mission really is to change the world by developing leaders for a free society. It's truly an important mission given the somewhat surprising national debate today about merits of socialism versus capitalism. For more than 40 years, Roger has pursued his passion to advance freedom and free markets, building programs that have preserved and expanded freedom both in America and around the world. Under his leadership, the Fund for American Studies has grown in reach and influence, adding international programs in Europe, Asia, and South America, as well as expanding to offer year-round academic and internship programs in Washington, D.C. And Roger is also a 2021 Bradley Prize winner, who happens to be born and raised in the Bradley Foundation's home state of Wisconsin. Welcome and congratulations, Roger. Thank you very much, Rick. I'm certainly very honored uh, to be among the very distinguished people who've received Bradley Prizes over uh, these many years. So thank you very much for that. Well, we're looking forward to the ceremony. Roger, let's jump in and, and drill down a little bit on this socialism versus capitalism debate. For several years now, the media has reported that more people are viewing, viewing socialism favorably, especially the younger generation. Uh, and at the same time, as you would expect, support of capitalism seems to be declining. What's your take on this? Well, uh, I think some of this is definitional and some of it represents a cultural shift in our country. Clearly, uh, polls show growing support for socialism, especially among younger Americans. Uh, but I think sometimes it's, it's definitional. If you ask uh, young people to compare socialism with capitalism, socialism does better than if you talk to young people about things like a free enterprise economy, entrepreneurship, free markets. And likewise, uh, if you ask them to try to explain what socialism is or whether they support some of the key uh, principles of socialism, you don't find that support. It tends to melt away. So they're in love with a concept they don't really understand, perhaps a reflection on our educational system. Uh, capitalism was a word that was popularized by Marx and Engels, and they wrote about it to talk about exploitation of workers uh, by management and by owners. So, you know, I've, I've debated uh, people, should we abandon the word capitalism? I like the word, but it's probably not as a descriptive word and comes with baggage. I will add, Rick, that beyond the definitional issues, certainly there's been a, a shift in our culture and uh, we've uh, seen a diminishing belief in self-reliance and personal responsibility. People come to accept uh, the welfare state and the transfer state and, and, and don't think there's anything wrong with the idea that government would provide our, our retirements, our, our pay for our education, pay for our health care. Uh, and that's ba basically socialism. And, and so we've got to fight the culture wars when it comes to those basic concepts that have sustained our, our free society for so many years. You touched on education. Do you think it's even possible to advance free market ideals within higher education? And if not, what's the alternative? Well, it, it is possible, uh, but it's very difficult. And donors certainly have to be very strategic and careful if they want to support their alma mater or, or an institution of higher education. Of course, there are exceptions. We're all familiar with Hillsdale College. Uh, there's Grove City College and some others, but there are very few. I would advise donors to be very targeted in their giving to higher education, uh, give to free market centers where they exist or to specific professors they can rely on and, and fund a, something for that professor to host a reading group of students or something like that, or give to a student organization that's committed to a free society. I would also highly recommend that donors uh, use donor advised funds, such as the Bradley Impact Fund and the others that exist, uh, because that's a way if you want to make, rather than make a large endowment gift, you can give it to a donor advised fund that will ensure that your intent is carried out uh, when you're no longer here to see to that. 
there's a there's a great story in uh, Jason Riley's new book about Tom's Thomas Sowell called Maverick, uh, and he talks about when Sowell was in graduate school at Chicago and was in need of money or he had to drop out. And Milton Friedman and George Stigler, I know two people who've been involved with the Bradley Foundation yes, over the years. Uh, they wrote a letter to the Earhart Foundation in Michigan and said, we've got this great young scholar. He needs money if he's going to stay in graduate school. Oh, and by the way, he's a Marxist, but he's too smart to stay one for long. And, and, and they got the money from Earhart. So the lesson there is uh, a private foundation uh, can invest in professors who can support graduate students. Don't give just to the institution itself. Uh, and then I, the last thing I would would add to that, Rick, would be donors should support the alternative organizations that exist. There are many of them, like mine, the Fund for American Studies, uh, Young America's Foundation, Leadership Institute, organizations like ACTA, the many organizations that work around the campus that either bring content to the campus or bring students and professors off the campus to learn. Uh, we've built up this, in a sense, alternative university uh, in the freedom movement that can really have a lot of impact uh, on students and professors if it's well supported. And, and has had a lot of impact uh, through the great work yeah. of people such as yourself. Uh, Roger, you've been in this movement now to advance freedom and limited government principles for four decades. How's the movement evolved over time? Well, it has certainly evolved. Uh, yeah, I, uh, it's probably a uh, you know, if I think of it in the form of chapters in a book, perhaps there, <laughs> there were the wilderness years of William F. Buckley and Barry Goldwater when, when uh, conservative ideas didn't find much support in Washington in policy. Uh, but the ideas were formulated there. Milton Friedman, you know, in his prime there formulating ideas and Hayek was writing and uh, you saw the founding of think tanks. So that, that was a really a precursor to what came next, the chapter I'd call Reaganomics or the Reagan years. The movement seemed uh, to be kind of fusionist where libertarians and traditional conservatives and anti-communist conservatives all worked together uh, because the enemy was great. It was the Cold War, it was communism, it was stagflation in Washington and growing regulatory state. And Reagan kind of was able to bring people together and, you know, we won the Cold War and some, you know, Francis Fukuyama called it the end of history. And uh, I think Irving Kristol, who's in the late seventies wrote an obituary for socialism. So we thought we'd won, but as you and I know, there are no permanent victories. Uh, and and uh, we're seeing now that the fight continues. Uh, the, the, the Bush years were, you know, we made some gains with the contract of America and the house and the efforts there to curtail the growth of government. Uh, but I would say, you know, it was kind of a, a quiet period. The freedom movement was not as vibrant in terms of developing ideas, perhaps, took a different form. And then, then, tr then Donald Trump came. And while he, he really blended traditional conservative policies, low taxes, less regulation, conservative judicial appointments, with some kind of ideas that diverge some from traditional free market thought, like his policies on trade and immigration were a bit different. Uh, and so I think right now it's, it's really an exciting time uh, in the freedom movement because there's a need for a real intellectual, there's a, there's a real intellectual discussion going on or debate uh, in the movement. I mean, in some ways it's discouraging because there seems to be a big split, but I think a, a movement has to go through a period like that where it's the time for discussions, writing books, articles, uh, having seminars and conferences and seeing this clash of ideas and where it takes us. And it's exciting to see so much that is going on, so many books being published and articles that I think we're going to come out of this with a real exciting effort to push forward ideas that will help get America back on track. I agree. I think it's a real inflection point. Uh, Roger, you have a fascinating personal story. You grew up in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, not far from Bradley's offices here in downtown Milwaukee as the child of a minister. How did your upbringing shape your career path? Well, I, I consider myself very blessed to have been born and raised in Wisconsin. I was actually born in Nina, but 
most of my life was in Wauwatosa, which had a great sense of community. Uh, I vividly recall, you know, parades on 4th of July and Memorial Day. We, we end up at the, the civic cemetery there for, for a memorial service. My dad would sometimes be asked to deliver a, a sermon there. Uh, I, I had a great home life. You know, the, the challenge of being a preacher's kid is you never know when something you say or do might end up in the Sunday sermon. And my, <laughs> my father loved to, uh, especially on Sundays after church, you know, ask the four of us, my siblings and me, you know, pose ethical dilemmas. Uh, I remember one that always challenged me was you're, you're a receiver on the Green Bay Packers and you catch a pass at the back of the end zone as the clock expires to win the game, but you know, and only you know that you really didn't catch it. It hit the ground as you came down. <laughs> do you tell the referee, I didn't catch the ball, <laughs> or do you let him <laughs> give you the touchdown? And, you know, questions like that that we discuss at the dinner table. And, uh, you know, my, my, also my father and my mother were both very involved in the freedom movement. Uh, my father would spent two summers in New York at Ludwig von Mises' economics seminars. Uh, and uh, had read books like Human Action and Red Hayek, and he went, got involved with Fee, and he wrote articles about freedom, about the right to work uh, from a clergyman's perspective. He had a piece called A Clergyman Looks at Free Enterprise, so I got that at home as well. Uh, I, I, I'm proud to say that one summer I worked at the Allen Bradley Corporation. Did you? Yeah, and uh, it was a great summer job. They treated you well if you're a summer worker, and uh, you earned a lot of money. So, and I worked another summer for the Milwaukee Brewers ground crew, one of their first seasons in Milwaukee, uh, delivered the Milwaukee Sentinel, but then morning paper. So I, I had a lot of formative experiences growing up there. Great stories. Great stories. Uh, last question, Roger, and uh, this is something that you've really spent your career focused on. What, what can be done to help younger people understand the tremendous positive impact of a free society? Well, you know, I, I've spent a few years trying to come up and or trying to discover that magic key, that, that one argument that would persuade someone who had socialist ideas, uh, the error of their ways and convert them to the belief in freedom and free markets. And I realized eventually that you have to try all different approaches with different people. Uh, I do think that it's very important that we we point out examples that wherever and whenever socialism has been tried, it's failed and it's failed miserably. Uh, and that's true for early experiments in this country like New Harmony and elsewhere where communities tried it. It was true for the pilgrims in that, those that early years before they went to private ownership and they were starving. And then it's true today, you know, the examples abound. Earlier in our lives, we had the divided Germany and divided Korea today that were great examples, the same people living in under two different systems, one flourishing and the other in misery. Uh, we, we have two young Venezuelans who work with us now. We send out to college campuses to tell the story of Venezuela uh, when people have gone from you know, owning pets to eating their pets because conditions have gotten so bad there. Uh, Cuba, you know, elsewhere, even, even Sweden. Uh, we like to bring in someone to talk about the Swedish experience because they did try a form of socialism with high taxes and it was failing miserably and they had to deregulate their economy, reduce taxes, uh, go to free trade to revive the Swedish model. So I think giving examples is one way. I think talking about moral and ethical principles, uh, showing how you know, a free society is, is the bedrock principles are the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, uh, and that freedom not only relies on uh, moral behavior, but it also encourages it. So there are lots of arguments, lots of approaches to take, and we need to take them all. Roger Reem, thanks so much for your time today, and thanks for your decades of service in the name of freedom. We, we truly do appreciate it. And of course, thanks to all of you, as always, for joining us on this edition of Conceived in Liberty. Thank you.